Chapter 25, Teaching Health Principles. Part 1, Instruction to be Given on Health Topics. The Need of Health Education. Education in health principles was never more needed than now. Notwithstanding the wonderful progress in so many lines relating to the comforts and conveniences of life, even to sanitary matters and to the treatment of disease, the decline in physical vigor and power of endurance is alarming. It demands the attention of all who have at heart the well-being of their fellow men. Our artificial civilization is encouraging evils destructive of sound principles. Custom and fashion are at war with nature. The practices they enjoin and the indulgences they foster are steadily lessening both physical and mental strength and bringing upon the race an intolerable burden. Intemperance and crime, disease and wretchedness are everywhere. Many transgress the laws of health through ignorance, and they need instruction. But the greater number know better than they do. They need to be impressed with the importance of making their knowledge a guide of life. There is great need of instruction in regard to dietetic reform. Wrong habits of eating and the use of unhealthful food are in no small degree responsible for the intemperance and crime and wretchedness that curse the world. If we would elevate the moral standard in any country where we may be called to go, we must begin by correcting their physical habits. Virtue of character depends upon the right action of the powers of the mind and body. Many will be enlightened. The Lord has presented before me that many, many will be rescued from physical, mental, and moral degeneracy through the practical influence of health reform. Health talks will be given. Publications will be multiplied. The principles of health reform will be received with favor, and many will be enlightened. The influences that are associated with health reform will commend it to the judgment of all who want light, and they will advance step by step to receive the special truths for this time. Thus, truth and righteousness will meet together. The gospel and the medical missionary work are to advance together. The gospel is to be bound up with the principles of true health reform. Christianity is to be brought into the practical life. Earnest, thorough, reformatory work is to be done. True Bible religion is an outflowing of the love of God for fallen man. God's people are to advance in straightforward lines to impress the hearts of those who are seeking for truth, who desire to act their part aright in this intensely earnest age. We are to present the principles of health reform before the people, doing all in our power to lead men and women to see the necessity of these principles and to practice them. Pioneer Efforts in Teaching Health Reform Principles When the State Fair was held in Battle Creek in 1864, our people took with them onto the grounds three or four cooking stoves and demonstrated how good meals might be prepared without the use of flesh meat. We were told that we set the best table on the ground. Whenever large gatherings are held, it is your privilege to devise plans whereby you can provide those who attend with wholesome food and you are to make your efforts educational. The Lord gave us favor with the people and we had many wonderful opportunities to demonstrate what could be done through the principles of health reform to restore to health those whose cases had been pronounced hopeless. At camp meetings and from house to house, we should put forth greater efforts to teach the people the truths of health reform 
at every camp meeting an effort should be made to demonstrate what can be done in providing an appetizing, wholesome diet from grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. In every place where new companies are brought into the truth, instructions should be given in the science of preparing wholesome food. Workers should be chosen who can labor from house to house in an educational campaign. The Medical Tent on the Campground As we near the close of time, we must rise higher and still higher upon the question of health reform and Christian temperance, presenting it in a more positive and decided manner. We must strive continually to educate the people not only by our words but by our practice. Precept and practice combined have a telling influence. At the camp meeting, instruction on health topics should be given to the people. At our meetings in Australia, lectures on health subjects were given daily and a deep interest was aroused. A tent for the use of physicians and nurses was on the ground. Medical advice was given freely and was sought by many. Thousands of people attended the lectures, and at the close of the camp meeting, the people were not satisfied to let the matter drop with what they had already learned. In several cities where camp meetings were held, some of the leading citizens urged that a branch sanitarium be established, promising their cooperation. By example as well as precept. The large gatherings of our people afford an excellent opportunity of illustrating the principles of health reform. Some years ago at these gatherings, much was said in regard to health reform and the benefits of a vegetarian diet. But at the same time, flesh meats were furnished at the tables in the dining tent, and various unhealthful articles of food were sold at the provision stand. Faith without work is dead, and the instruction upon health reform denied by practice, did not make the deepest impression. At later camp meetings, those in charge have educated by practice as well as by precept. No meat has been furnished at the dining tent, but fruits, grains, and vegetables have been supplied in abundance. As visitors ask questions in regard to the absence of meat, the reason is plainly stated that flesh is not the most healthful food. In our sanitariums, the light given me was that a sanitarium should be established and that in it drug medication should be discarded and simple rational methods of treatment employed for the healing of disease. In this institution, people were to be taught how to dress, breathe, and eat properly how to prevent sickness by proper habits of living. Our sanitariums are to be the means of enlightening those who come to them for treatment. The patients are to be shown how they can live upon a diet of grains, fruits, nuts, and other products of the soil. I have been instructed that lectures should be regularly given in our sanitariums on health topics. People are to be taught to discard those articles of food that weaken the health and strength of the beings for whom Christ gave his life. The injurious effects of tea and coffee are to be shown. The patients are to be taught how they can dispense with those articles of diet that injure the digestive organs. Let the patients be shown the necessity of practicing the principles of health reform if they would regain their health. Let the sick be shown how to get well by being temperate in eating and by taking regular exercise in the open air. By the work of our sanitariums, suffering is to be relieved and health restored. People are to be taught how, by carefulness in eating and drinking, they may keep well. Abstinence from flesh meat will benefit those who abstain. The diet question is a subject of living interest. Our sanitariums are established for a special purpose, to teach people that we do not live to eat, 
but that we eat to live. Educate patients in home nursing. Keep the patients out of doors as much as possible and give them cheering, happy talks in the parlor with simple reading and Bible lessons, easy to be understood, which will be an encouragement to the soul. Talk on health reform, and do not you, my brother, become burden-bearer in so many lines that you cannot teach the simple lessons of health reform. Those who go from the sanitarium should go so well instructed that they can teach others the methods of treating their families. There is danger of spending far too much money on machinery and appliances which the patients can never use in their home lessons. They should rather be taught how to regulate the diet so that the living machinery of the whole being will work in harmony. Temperance instruction to be given. In our medical institutions, clear instruction should be given in regard to temperance. The patients should be shown the evil of intoxicating liquor and the blessing of total abstinence. They should be asked to discard the things that have ruined their health, and the place of these things should be supplied with an abundance of fruit. Oranges, lemons, prunes, peaches, and many other varieties can be obtained, for the Lord's world is productive if painstaking effort is put forth. Those who are struggling against the power of appetite should be instructed in the principles of healthful living. They should be shown that violation of the laws of health by creating diseased conditions and unnatural cravings lays the foundation of the liquor habit. Only by living in obedience to the principles of health can they hope to be freed from the craving for unnatural stimulants. While they depend upon divine strength, to break the bonds of appetite, they are to cooperate with God by obedience to His laws, both moral and physical. Comprehensive nature of reform required. What is the special work that we are called upon to do in our health institutions? Instead of giving by precept and example an education in the indulgence of perverted appetite, Educate away from these things. Lift the standard of reform in every line. The Apostle Paul lifts up his voice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our health institutions are established to present the living principles of a clean, pure, healthful diet. The knowledge must be imparted in regard to self-denial, self-control. Jesus, who made man and redeemed man, is to be held up before all who shall come to our institutions. The knowledge of the way of life, peace, health must be given line upon line, precept upon precept, that men and women may see the need of reform. They must be led to renounce the debasing customs and practices which existed in Sodom and in the antediluvian world, which God destroyed because of their iniquity. All who shall visit our health institutions are to be educated. The plan of redemption should be brought before all, high and low, rich and poor. Carefully prepared instruction is to be given that indulgence in fashionable intemperance in eating and drinking may be seen as the cause of disease and suffering and of evil practices that follow as a result. Leaves from the tree of life. I have been instructed that we are not to delay to do the work that needs to be done in health reform lines. Through this work, we are to reach souls in the highways and byways. 
I have been given special light that in our sanitariums many souls will receive and obey present truth. In these institutions, men and women are to be taught how to care for their own bodies and at the same time how to become sound in the faith. They are to be taught what is meant by eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of God. Said Christ, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Our sanitariums are to be schools in which instruction shall be given in medical missionary lines. They are to bring to sin-sick souls the leaves of the tree of life, which will restore to them peace and hope and faith in Christ Jesus. Preparation for Prayer for Healing It is labor lost to teach people to look to God as a healer of their infirmities unless they are taught also to lay aside unhealthful practices. In order to receive his blessing in answer to prayer, they must cease to do evil and learn to do well. Their surroundings must be sanitary, their habits of life correct. They must live in harmony with the laws of God, both natural and spiritual. The physician's responsibility to enlighten his patients. The health institutions for the sick will be the best places to educate the suffering ones to live in accordance with nature's laws and cease their health-destroying practices in wrong habits, in diet, in dress that are in accordance with the world's habits and customs which are not at all after God's order. They are doing a good work to enlighten our world. There is now positive need even with physicians, reformers in the line of treatment of disease, that greater painstaking effort be made to carry forward and upward the work for themselves and to interestedly instruct those who look to them for medical skill to ascertain the cause of their infirmities. They should call their attention in a special manner to the laws which God has established which cannot be violated with impunity. They dwell much upon the working of disease, but do not, as a general rule, arouse the attention to the laws which must be sacredly and intelligently obeyed to prevent disease, especially if the physician has not been correct in his dietetic practices, if his own appetite has not been restricted to a plain, wholesome diet, in a large measure, discarding the use of the flesh of dead animals. He loves meat. He has educated and cultivated a taste for unhealthful food. His ideas are narrow, and he will as soon educate and discipline the taste and the appetite of his patients to love the things that he loves as to give them the sound principles of health reform. He will prescribe for sick patients flesh meat when it is the very worst diet that they can have. It stimulates but does not give strength. They do not inquire into their former habits of eating and drinking and take special notice of their erroneous habits which have been for many years laying the foundation of disease. Conscientious physicians should be prepared to enlighten those who are ignorant and should with wisdom make out their prescriptions, prohibiting those things in their diet which they know to be erroneous. They should plainly state the things which they regard as detrimental to the laws of health and leave these suffering ones to work conscientiously to do those things for themselves which they can do and thus place themselves in right relation to the laws of life and health. A Solemn Charge When a physician sees that a patient is suffering from an ailment caused by improper eating and drinking, yet neglects to tell him of this and to point out the need of reform, he is doing a fellow being an injury. Drunkards, maniacs, those who are given over to licentiousness all appeal to the physician 
to declare clearly and distinctly that suffering is the result of sin. We have received great light on health reform. Why then are we not more decidedly in earnest in striving to counteract the causes that produce disease? Seeing the continual conflict with pain, laboring constantly to alleviate suffering, how can our physicians hold their peace? Can they refrain from lifting the voice in warning? Are they benevolent and merciful if they do not teach strict temperance as a remedy for disease? Moral courage required by diet reformers. A great amount of good can be done by enlightening all to whom we have access as to the best means not only of curing the sick but of preventing disease and suffering. The physician who endeavors to enlighten his patients as to the nature and causes of their maladies and to teach them how to avoid disease may have uphill work. But if he is a conscientious reformer, he will talk plainly of the ruinous effects of self-indulgence in eating, drinking, and dressing, of the overtaxation of the vital forces that has brought his patients where they are. He will not increase the evil by administering drugs till exhausted nature gives up the struggle, but will teach the patients how to form correct habits and to aid nature in her work of restoration by a wise use of her own simple remedies. In all our health institutions, it should be made a special feature of the work to give instruction in regard to the laws of health. The principles of health reform should be carefully and thoroughly set before all, both patients and helpers. This work requires moral courage, for while many will profit by such efforts, others will be offended. But the true disciple of Christ, he whose mind is in harmony with the mind of God, while constantly learning, will be teaching as well, leading the minds of others upward, away from the prevailing errors of the world. Cooperation of Sanitariums in Schools Clear light has been given that our educational institutions should be connected with our sanitariums wherever this is possible. The work of the two institutions is to blend. I am thankful that we have a school at Loma Linda. The educational talent of competent physicians is a necessity to the schools where medical missionary evangelists are to be trained for service. The students in the school are to be taught to be strict health reformers. The instruction given in regard to disease and its causes and how to prevent disease and the training given in the treatment of the sick will prove an invaluable education and one that the students in all our schools should have. This blending of our schools and sanitariums will prove an advantage in many ways. Through the instruction given by the sanitarium, students will learn how to avoid forming careless, intemperate habits in eating. In evangelistic work and city missions, as a people, we have been given the work of making known the principles of health reform. There are some who think that the question of diet is not of sufficient importance to be included in their evangelistic work, but such make a great mistake. God's Word declares, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. The subject of temperance in all its bearings has an important place in the work of salvation. In connection with our city missions, there should be suitable rooms where those in whom an interest has been awakened can be gathered for instruction. This necessary work is not to be carried on in such a meager way that an unfavorable impression will be made on the minds of the people. All that is done should bear favorable witness to the author of truth, 
and should properly represent the sacredness and importance of the truths of the third angel's message. In all our missions, women of intelligence should have charge of the domestic arrangements, women who know how to prepare food nicely and healthfully. The table should be abundantly supplied with food of the best quality. If any have a perverted taste that craves tea, coffee, condiments, and unhealthful dishes, enlighten them. Seek to arouse the conscience. Set before them the principles of the Bible upon hygiene. Let ministers teach reform principles. We should educate ourselves not only to live in harmony with the laws of health, but to teach others the better way. Many, even of those who profess to believe the special truths for this time, are lamentably ignorant with regard to health and temperance. They need to be educated line upon line, precept upon precept. The subject must be kept fresh before them. This matter must not be passed over as non-essential, for nearly every family needs to be stirred up on the question. The conscience must be aroused to the duty of practicing the principles of true reform. God requires that his people shall be temperate in all things. Unless they practice true temperance, they will not, they cannot, be susceptible to the sanctifying influence of the truth. Our ministers should become intelligent upon this question. They should not ignore it, nor be turned aside by those who call them extremists. Let them find out what constitutes true health reform and teach its principles, both by precept and by a quiet, consistent example. At our large gatherings, instruction should be given upon health and temperance. Seek to arouse the intellect and the conscience. Bring into service all the talent at command and follow up the work with publications upon the subject. Educate, educate, educate is the message that has been impressed upon me. As we near the close of time, we must rise higher and still higher upon the question of health reform and Christian temperance, presenting it in a more positive and decided manner. We must strive continually to educate the people not only by our words, but by our practice. Precept and practice combined have a telling influence. Appeal to ministers, conference presidents, and other leaders. Our ministers should become intelligent on health reform. They need to become acquainted with physiology and hygiene. They should understand the laws that govern physical life and their bearing upon the health of mind and soul. Thousands upon thousands know little of the wonderful body God has given them or of the care it should receive, and they consider it of more importance to study subjects of far less consequence. The ministers have a work to do here. When they take a right position on this subject, much will be gained. In their own lives and homes, they should obey the laws of life, practicing right principles and living healthfully. Then they will be able to speak correctly on this subject, leading the people higher and still higher in the work of reform. Living in the light themselves, they can bear a message of great value to those who are in need of just such a testimony. There are precious blessings and a rich experience to be gained if ministers will combine the presentation of the health question with all their labors in the churches. The people must have the light on health reform. This work has been neglected, and many are ready to die because they need the light which they ought to have and must have before they will give up selfish indulgence. The presidents of our conferences need to realize that it is high time they were placing themselves on the right side of this question. Ministers and teachers are to give the others the light they have received. Their work in every line is needed. God will help them. 
He will strengthen his servants who stand firmly and will not be swayed from truth and righteousness in order to accommodate all self-indulgence. The work of educating in medical missionary lines is an advanced step of great importance in awakening man to his moral responsibilities. Had the ministers taken hold of this work in its various departments in accordance with the light which God has given, there would have been a most decided reformation in eating, drinking, and dressing. But some have stood directly in the way of the advance of health reform. They have held the people back by their indifferent or condemnatory remarks or by pleasantries and jokes. They themselves and a large number of others have been sufferers unto death, but all have not yet learned wisdom. It has been only by the most aggressive warfare that any advancement has been made. The people have been unwilling to deny self, unwilling to yield the mind and will to the will of God, and in their own sufferings and in their influence on others, they have realized the sure result of such a course. The Church is making history. Every day is a battle and a march. On every side we are beset by invisible foes, and we either conquer through the grace given us by God, or we are conquered. I urge that those who are taking a neutral position in regard to health reform be converted. This light is precious, and the Lord gives me the message to urge that all who bear responsibilities in any line in the work of God take heed that truth is in the ascendancy in the heart and life. Only thus can any meet the temptations they are sure to encounter in the world. Failure to practice health reform disqualifies for the ministry. Why do some of our ministering brethren manifest so little interest in health reform? It is because instruction on temperance in all things is opposed to their practice of self-indulgence. In some places this has been the great stumbling block in the way of our bringing the people to investigate and practice and teach health reform. No man should be set apart as a teacher of the people while his own teaching or example contradicts the testimony God has given his servants to bear in regard to diet, for this will bring confusion. His disregard of health reform unfits him to stand as the Lord's messenger. The light that the Lord has given on this subject in his word is plain, and men will be tested and tried in many ways to see if they will heed it. Every church, every family, needs to be instructed in regard to Christian temperance. All should know how to eat and drink in order to preserve health. We are amid the closing scenes of this world's history, and there should be harmonious action in the ranks of Sabbath keepers. Those who stand aloof from the great work of instructing the people upon this question do not follow where the great physician leads the way. If any man will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24 Health education in the home. Parents should live more for their children and less for society. Study health subjects and put your knowledge to a practical use. Teach your children to reason from cause to effect. Teach them that if they desire health and happiness, they must obey the laws of nature. Though you may not see so rapid improvement as you desire, be not discouraged, but patiently and perseveringly continue your work. Teach your children from the cradle to practice self-denial and self-control. Teach them to enjoy the beauties of nature and in useful employments to exercise systematically all the powers of body and mind. Bring them up to have sound constitutions and good morals, 
to have sunny dispositions and sweet tempers, impress upon their tender minds the truth that God does not design that we should live for present gratification merely, but for our ultimate good. Teach them that to yield to temptation is weak and wicked, to resist noble and manly. These lessons will be as seeds sown in good soil, and they will bear fruit that will make your hearts glad. God's work hindered by selfish indulgence. There is a message regarding health reform to be born in every church. There is a work to be done in every school. Neither principal nor teachers should be entrusted with the education of the youth until they have a practical knowledge of this subject. Some have felt at liberty to criticize and question and find fault with health reform principles of which they know little by experience. They should stand shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, with those who are working in right lines. The subject of health reform has been presented in the churches, but the light has not been heartily received. The selfish, health-destroying indulgences of men and women have counteracted the influence of the message that is to prepare a people for the great day of God. If the churches expect strength, they must live the truth which God has given them. If the members of our churches disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result in both spiritual and physical degeneracy. And the influence of these older church members will leaven those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? Every member to impart truth. We have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. The world is a laser house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing for lack of a knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us. The members of the church are in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. Those who have been enlightened by the truth are to be light bearers to the world. To hide our light at this time is to make a terrible mistake. The message to God's people today is, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. On every hand we see those who have had much light and knowledge deliberately choosing evil in the place of good. Making no attempt to reform, they are growing worse and worse, but the people of God are not to walk in darkness. They are to walk in the light, for they are reformers. Establish new centers. It is the positive duty of God's people to go into the regions beyond. Let forces be set at work to clear new ground, to establish new centers of influence wherever an opening can be found. Rally workers who possess true missionary zeal and let them go forth to diffuse light and knowledge far and near. Let them take the living principles of health reform into the communities that to a large degree are ignorant of these principles. Let classes be formed and instruction be given regarding the treatment of disease. There is a wide field of service for women as well as for men. The efficient cook, the seamstress, the nurse, the help of all is needed. Let the members of poor households be taught how to cook, how to make and mend their own clothing, how to nurse the sick, how to care properly for the home. 
Even the children should be taught to do some little errand of love and mercy for those less fortunate than themselves. Educators, go forward. The work of health reform is the Lord's means for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying His Church. Teach the people that they can act as God's helping hand by cooperating with the Master Worker in restoring physical and spiritual health. This work bears the signature of heaven and will open doors for the entrance of other precious truths. There is room for all to labor who will take hold of this work intelligently. Keep the work of health reform to the front is the message I am instructed to bear. Show so plainly its value that a widespread need for it will be felt. Abstinence from all hurtful food and drink is the fruit of true religion. He who is thoroughly converted will abandon every injurious habit and appetite. By total abstinence he will overcome his desire for health-destroying indulgences. I am instructed to say to health reform educators, go forward. The world needs every jot of the influence you can exert to press back the tide of moral woe. Let those who teach the third angel's message stand true to their colors. Part 2. How to Present the Principles of Health Reform Keep in view the great object of reform. There is great need of instruction in regard to dietetic reform. Wrong habits of eating and the use of unhealthful food are in no small degree responsible for the intemperance and crime and wretchedness that curse the world. In teaching health principles, keep before the mind the great object of reform, that its purpose is to secure the highest development of body and mind and soul. Show that the laws of nature, being the laws of God, are designed for our good, that obedience to them promotes happiness in this life and aids in the preparation for the life to come. Lead the people to study the manifestation of God's love and wisdom in the works of nature. Lead them to study that marvelous organism, the human system, and the laws by which it is governed. Those who perceive the evidences of God's love who understand something of the wisdom and beneficence of His laws and the results of obedience, will come to regard their duties and obligations from an altogether different point of view. Instead of looking upon an observance of the laws of health as a matter of sacrifice or self-denial, they will regard it as it really is, as an inestimable blessing. Every gospel worker should feel that the giving of instruction in the principles of healthful living is a part of his appointed work. Of this work there is great need, and the world is open for it. The requirements of God must be brought home to the conscience. Men and women must be awakened to the duty of self-mastery, the need of purity, freedom from every depraving appetite and defiling habit. They need to be impressed with the fact that all their powers of mind and body are the gift of God and are to be preserved in the best possible condition for His service. Follow the Savior's methods. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed His sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, Follow me. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, 
cannot be without fruit. We should ever remember that the object of the medical missionary work is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary who taketh away the sin of the world. By beholding him, they will be changed into his likeness. We to, are to encourage the sick and suffering to look to Jesus and live. Let the workers keep Christ, the great physician, constantly before those to whom disease of the body and soul has brought discouragement. Point them to the one who can heal both physical and spiritual disease. Tell them of the one who is touched with the feeling of their infirmities. Encourage them to place themselves in the care of him who gave his life to make it possible for them to have life eternal. Talk of his love. Tell of his power to save. Use tact and courtesy. In all your work, remember that you are bound up with Christ, a part of the great plan of redemption. The love of Christ in a healing, life-giving current is to flow through your life. As you seek to draw others within the circle of his love, let the purity of your language, the unselfishness of your service, the joyfulness of your demeanor, bear witness to the power of his grace. Give to the world so pure and righteous a representation of him that men shall behold him in his beauty. It is of little use to try to reform others by attacking what we may regard as wrong habits. Such effort often results in more harm than good. In his talk with the Samaritan woman, instead of disparaging Jacob's well, Christ presented something better. If thou knewest the gift of God, he said, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He turned the conversation to the treasure he had to bestow, offering the woman something better than she possessed, even living water, the joy and hope of the gospel. This is an illustration of the way in which we are to work. We must offer men something better than that which they possess, even the peace of Christ, which passeth all understanding. We must tell them of God's holy law, the transcript of his character, and an expression of that which he wishes them to become. Of all the people in the world, Reformers should be the most unselfish, the most kind, the most courteous. In their lives should be seen the true goodness of unselfish deeds. The worker who manifests a lack of courtesy, who shows impatience at the ignorance or waywardness of others, who speaks hastily or acts thoughtlessly, may close the door to hearts so that he can never reach them. Diet Reform to be Progressive From the beginning of the health reform work, we have found it necessary to educate, educate, educate. God desires us to continue this work of educating the people. In teaching health reform, as in all other gospel work, we are to meet the people where they are. Until we can teach them how to prepare health reform foods that are palatable, nourishing, and yet inexpensive, we are not at liberty to present the most advanced propositions regarding health reform diet. Let the diet reform be progressive. Let the people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. Tell them that the time will come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter, because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. The time is near when, because of the iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan under the diseases that curse our earth. God will give his people ability and tact 
to prepare wholesome food without these things. Let our people discard all unwholesome recipes. Let them learn how to live healthfully, teaching to others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would Bible instruction. Let them teach the people to preserve the health and increase the strength by avoiding the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic invalids. By precept and example, make it plain that the food which God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for man's use as he seeks to regain that sinless state. Those who teach the principles of health reform should be intelligent in regard to disease and its causes, understanding that every action of the human agent should be in perfect harmony with the laws of life. The light God has given on health reform is for our salvation and the salvation of the world. Men and women should be informed in regard to the human habitation fitted up by our Creator as His dwelling place and over which He desires us to be faithful stewards. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 Hold up the principles of health reform and let the Lord lead the honest in heart. Present the principles of temperance in their most attractive form. Circulate the books that give instruction in regard to healthful living. The influence of our health publications. The people are in sad need of the light shining from the pages of our health books and journals. God desires to use these books and journals as mediums through which flashes of light shall arrest the attention of the people and cause them to heed the warning of the message of the third angel. Our health journals are instrumentalities in the field to do a special work in disseminating the light that the inhabitants of the world must have in this day of God's preparation. They wield an untold influence in the interests of health and temperance and social purity reform and will accomplish great good in presenting these subjects in a proper manner and in their true light to the people. Tracts on health reform. There should be more earnest efforts made to enlighten the people upon the great subject of health reform. Tracts of 4, 8, 12, 16, and more pages containing pointed, well-written articles on this great question should be scattered like the leaves of autumn. Handle the flesh meat question wisely. In this country of Australia, there is an organized vegetarian society but its numbers are comparatively few. Among the people in general, meat is largely used by all classes. It is the cheapest article of food, and even where poverty abounds, meat is usually found upon the table. Therefore, there is the more need of handling wisely the question of meat eating. In regard to this matter, there should be no rash movements. We should consider the situation of the people and the power of lifelong habits and practices and should be careful not to urge our ideas upon others as if this question were a test and those who eat largely of meat were the greatest sinners. All should have the light on this question, but let it be carefully presented. Habits that have been thought right for a lifetime are not to be changed by harsh or hasty measures. We should educate the people at our camp meetings and other large gatherings. While the principles of health reform should be presented, let the teaching be backed by example. Let no meat be found at our restaurants or dining tents, but let its place be supplied with fruits, grains, and vegetables. We must practice what we teach. When sitting at a table where meat is provided, we are not to make a raid upon those who use it but we should let it alone ourselves. 
and when asked our reasons for doing this, we should in a kindly manner explain why we do not use it. A time to keep silent. I have never felt that it was my duty to say that no one should taste of meat under any circumstances. To say this when the people have been educated to live on flesh to so great an extent would be carrying matters to extremes. I have never felt that it was my duty to make sweeping assertions. What I have said, I have said under a sense of duty, but I have been guarded in my statements because I did not want to give occasion for anyone to be conscience for another. Our ministers should become intelligent upon this question. They should not ignore it, nor be turned aside by those who call them extremists. Let them find out what constitutes true health reform and teach its principles, both by precept and by a quiet, consistent example. At our large gatherings, Instruction should be given upon health and temperance. Seek to arouse the intellect and the conscience. Bring into service all the talent at command and follow up the work with publications upon the subject. Educate, educate, educate is the message that has been impressed upon me. As we near the close of time, we must rise higher and still higher upon the question of health reform and Christian temperance, presenting it in a more positive and decided manner. We must strive continually to educate the people, not only by our words, but by our practice. Precept and practice combined have a telling influence. Appeal to ministers, conference presidents, and other leaders. Our ministers should become intelligent on health reform. They need to become acquainted with physiology and hygiene. They should understand the laws that govern physical life and their bearing upon the health of mind and soul. Thousands upon thousands know little of the wonderful body God has given them or of the care it should receive, and they consider it of more importance to study subjects of far less consequence. The ministers have a work to do here. When they take a right position on this subject, much will be gained. In their own lives and homes, they should obey the laws of life, practicing right principles and living healthfully. Then they will be able to speak correctly on this subject, leading the people higher and still higher in the work of reform. Living in the light themselves, they can bear a message of great value to those who are in need of just such a testimony. There are precious blessings and a rich experience to be gained if ministers will combine the presentation of the health question with all their labors in the churches. The people must have the light on health reform. This work has been neglected, and many are ready to die because they need the light which they ought to have and must have before they will give up selfish indulgence. The presidents of our conferences need to realize that it is high time they were placing themselves on the right side of this question. Ministers and teachers are to give the others the light they have received. Their work in every line is needed. God will help them. He will strengthen his servants who stand firmly and will not be swayed from truth and righteousness in order to accommodate all self-indulgence. The work of educating in medical missionary lines is an advanced step of great importance in awakening man to his moral responsibilities. Had the ministers taken hold of this work in its various departments in accordance with the light which God has given, there would have been a most decided reformation in eating, drinking, and dressing. But some have stood directly in the way of the advance of health reform. They have held the people back by their indifferent or condemnatory remarks, or by pleasantries and jokes. They themselves and a large number of others have been sufferers unto death 
but all have not yet learned wisdom. It has been only by the most aggressive warfare that any advancement has been made. The people have been unwilling to deny self, unwilling to yield the mind and will to the will of God, and in their own sufferings and in their influence on others, they have realized the sure result of such a course. The Church is making history. Every day is a battle and a march. On every side we are beset by invisible foes, and we either conquer through the grace given us by God, or we are conquered. I urge that those who are taking a neutral position in regard to health reform be converted. This light is precious, and the Lord gives me the message to urge that all who bear responsibilities in any line in the work of God Take heed that truth is in the ascendancy in the heart and life. Only thus can any meet the temptations they are sure to encounter in the world. Failure to practice health reform disqualifies for the ministry. Why do some of our ministering brethren manifest so little interest in health reform? It is because instruction on temperance in all things is opposed to their practice of self-indulgence. In some places this has been the great stumbling block in the way of our bringing the people to investigate and practice and teach health reform. No man should be set apart as a teacher of the people while his own teaching or example contradicts the testimony God has given his servants to bear in regard to diet for this will bring confusion. His disregard of health reform unfits him to stand as the Lord's messenger. The light that the Lord has given on this subject in his word is plain, and men will be tested and tried in many ways to see if they will heed it. Every church, every family, needs to be instructed in regard to Christian temperance. All should know how to eat and drink in order to preserve health. We are amid the closing scenes of this world's history, and there should be harmonious action in the ranks of Sabbath keepers. Those who stand aloof from the great work of instructing the people upon this question do not follow where the great physician leads the way. If any man will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24 Health Education in the Home Parents should live more for their children and less for society. Study health subjects and put your knowledge to a practical use. Teach your children to reason from cause to effect. Teach them that if they desire health and happiness, they must obey the laws of nature. Though you may not see so rapid improvement as you desire, be not discouraged, but patiently and perseveringly continue your work. Teach your children from the cradle to practice self-denial and self-control. Teach them to enjoy the beauties of nature and in useful employments to exercise systematically all the powers of body and mind. Bring them up to have sound constitutions and good morals, to have sunny dispositions and sweet tempers. Impress upon their tender minds the truth that God does not design that we should live for present gratification merely, but for our ultimate good. Teach them that to yield to temptation is weak and wicked, to resist noble and manly. These lessons will be as seeds sown in good soil, and they will bear fruit that will make your hearts glad. God's work hindered by selfish indulgence. There is a message regarding health reform to be born in every church. There is a work to be done in every school. Neither principal nor teachers should be entrusted with the education of the youth until they have a practical knowledge of this subject. 
Some have felt at liberty to criticize and question and find fault with health reform principles, of which they know little by experience. They should stand shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, with those who are working in right lines. The subject of health reform has been presented in the churches, but the light has not been heartily received. The selfish, health-destroying indulgences of men and women have counteracted the influence of the message that is to prepare a people for the great day of God. If the churches expect strength, they must live the truth which God has given them. If the members of our churches disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result in both spiritual and physical degeneracy. And the influence of these older church members will leaven those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? Every member to impart truth. We have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. The world is a laser house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing for lack of a knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us. The members of the church are in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. Those who have been enlightened by the truth are to be light bearers to the world. To hide our light at this time is to make a terrible mistake. The message to God's people today is, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. On every hand, we see those who have had much light and knowledge deliberately choosing evil in the place of good. Making no attempt to reform, they are growing worse and worse. But the people of God are not to walk in darkness. They are to walk in the light, for they are reformers. Establish new centers. It is the positive duty of God's people to go into the regions beyond. Let forces be set at work to clear new ground, to establish new centers of influence wherever an opening can be found. Rally workers who possess true missionary zeal and let them go forth to diffuse light and knowledge far and near. Let them take the living principles of health reform into the communities that to a large degree are ignorant of these principles. Let classes be formed and instruction be given regarding the treatment of disease. There is a wide field of service for women as well as for men. The efficient cook, the seamstress, the nurse, the help of all is needed. Let the members of poor households be taught how to cook, how to make and mend their own clothing, how to nurse the sick, how to care properly for the home. Even the children should be taught to do some little errand of love and mercy for those less fortunate than themselves. Educators, go forward. The work of health reform is the Lord's means for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying his church. Teach the people that they can act as God's helping hand by cooperating with the master worker in restoring physical and spiritual health. This work bears the signature of heaven and will open doors for the entrance of other precious truths. There is room for all to labor who will take hold of this work intelligently. Keep the work of health reform to the front is the message I am instructed to bear. Show so plainly its value that a widespread need for it will be felt. Abstinence from all hurtful food and drink is the fruit of true religion. 
he who is thoroughly converted will abandon every injurious habit and appetite. By total abstinence he will overcome his desire for health-destroying indulgences. I am instructed to say to health reform educators, go forward. The world needs every jot of the influence you can exert to press back the tide of moral woe. Let those who teach the third angel's message stand true to their colors. Part 2. How to Present the Principles of Health Reform Keep in view the great object of reform. There is great need of instruction in regard to dietetic reform. Wrong habits of eating and the use of unhealthful food are in no small degree responsible for the intemperance and crime and wretchedness that curse the world. In teaching health principles, keep before the mind the great object of reform, that its purpose is to secure the highest development of body and mind and soul. Show that the laws of nature, being the laws of God, are designed for our good, that obedience to them promotes happiness in this life and aids in the preparation for the life to come. Lead the people to study the manifestation of God's love and wisdom in the works of nature. Lead them to study that marvelous organism, the human system, and the laws by which it is governed. Those who perceive the evidences of God's love who understand something of the wisdom and beneficence of his laws and the results of obedience will come to regard their duties and obligations from an altogether different point of view. Instead of looking upon an observance of the laws of health as a matter of sacrifice or self-denial, they will regard it as it really is, as an inestimable blessing. Every gospel worker should feel that the giving of instruction in the principles of healthful living is a part of his appointed work. Of this work there is great need, and the world is open for it. The requirements of God must be brought home to the conscience. Men and women must be awakened to the duty of self-mastery, the need of purity, freedom from every depraving appetite and defiling habit. They need to be impressed with the fact that all their powers of mind and body are the gift of God and are to be preserved in the best possible condition for His service. Follow the Savior's methods. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed His sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, Follow me. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. We should ever remember that the object of the medical missionary work is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary who taketh away the sin of the world. By beholding him, they will be changed into his likeness. We to, are to encourage the sick and suffering to look to Jesus and live. Let the workers keep Christ, the great physician, constantly before those to whom disease of the body and soul has brought discouragement. Point them to the one who can heal both physical and spiritual disease. Tell them of the one who is touched with the feeling of their infirmities. Encourage them to place themselves in the care of him who gave his life to make it possible for them to have life eternal. Talk of his love. Tell of his power to save. 
use tact and courtesy. In all your work, remember that you are bound up with Christ, a part of the great plan of redemption. The love of Christ in a healing, life-giving current is to flow through your life. As you seek to draw others within the circle of his love, let the purity of your language, the unselfishness of your service, the joyfulness of your demeanor, bear witness to the power of his grace. Give to the world so pure and righteous a representation of him that men shall behold him in his beauty. It is of little use to try to reform others by attacking what we may regard as wrong habits. Such effort often results in more harm than good. In his talk with the Samaritan woman, instead of disparaging Jacob's well, Christ presented something better. If thou knewest the gift of God, he said, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He turned the conversation to the treasure he had to bestow, offering the woman something better than she possessed, even living water, the joy and hope of the gospel. This is an illustration of the way in which we are to work. We must offer men something better than that which they possess, even the peace of Christ, which passeth all understanding. We must tell them of God's holy law, the transcript of his character, and an expression of that which he wishes them to become. Of all the people in the world, reformers should be the most unselfish, the most kind, the most courteous. In their lives should be seen the true goodness of unselfish deeds. The worker who manifests a lack of courtesy, who shows impatience at the ignorance or waywardness of others, who speaks hastily or acts thoughtlessly, may close the door to hearts so that he can never reach them. Diet Reform to be Progressive From the beginning of the health reform work, we have found it necessary to educate, educate, educate. God desires us to continue this work of educating the people. In teaching health reform, as in all other gospel work, we are to meet the people where they are. Until we can teach them how to prepare health reform foods that are palatable, nourishing, and yet inexpensive, we are not at liberty to present the most advanced propositions regarding health reform diet. Let the diet reform be progressive. Let the people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. Tell them that the time will come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter, because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. The time is near when, because of the iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan under the diseases that curse our earth. God will give his people ability and tact to prepare wholesome food without these things. Let our people discard all unwholesome recipes. Let them learn how to live healthfully, teaching to others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would Bible instruction. Let them teach the people to preserve the health and increase the strength by avoiding the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic invalids. By precept and example, make it plain that the food which God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for man's use as he seeks to regain that sinless state. Those who teach the principles of health reform should be intelligent in regard to disease and its causes, 
understanding that every action of the human agent should be in perfect harmony with the laws of life. The light God has given on health reform is for our salvation and the salvation of the world. Men and women should be informed in regard to the human habitation fitted up by our Creator as His dwelling place and over which He desires us to be faithful stewards. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 Hold up the principles of health reform and let the Lord lead the honest in heart. Present the principles of temperance in their most attractive form. Circulate the books that give instruction in regard to healthful living. The influence of our health publications. The people are in sad need of the light shining from the pages of our health books and journals. God desires to use these books and journals as mediums through which flashes of light shall arrest the attention of the people and cause them to heed the warning of the message of the third angel. Our health journals are instrumentalities in the field to do a special work in disseminating the light that the inhabitants of the world must have in this day of God's preparation. They wield an untold influence in the interests of health and temperance and social purity reform and will accomplish great good in presenting these subjects in a proper manner and in their true light to the people. Tracts on Health Reform There should be more earnest efforts made to enlighten the people upon the great subject of health reform. Tracts of four, eight, 12, 16, and more pages containing pointed, well-written articles on this great question should be scattered like the leaves of autumn. Handle the flesh meat question wisely. In this country of Australia, there is an organized vegetarian society, but its numbers are comparatively few. Among the people in general, Meat is largely used by all classes. It is the cheapest article of food, and even where poverty abounds, meat is usually found upon the table. Therefore, there is the more need of handling wisely the question of meat eating. In regard to this matter, there should be no rash movements. We should consider the situation of the people and the power of lifelong habits and practices, and should be careful not to urge our ideas upon others, as if this question were a test, and those who eat largely of meat were the greatest sinners. All should have the light on this question, but let it be carefully presented. Habits that have been thought right for a lifetime are not to be changed by harsh or hasty measures. We should educate the people at our camp meetings and other large gatherings. While the principles of health reform should be presented, let the teaching be backed by example. Let no meat be found at our restaurants or dining tents, but let its place be supplied with fruits, grains, and vegetables. We must practice what we teach. When sitting at a table where meat is provided, we are not to make a raid upon those who use it, but we should let it alone ourselves. And when asked our reasons for doing this, we should in a kindly manner explain why we do not use it. A time to keep silent. I have never felt that it was my duty to say that no one should taste of meat under any circumstances. To say this when the people have been educated to live on flesh to so great an extent would be carrying matters to extremes. I have never felt that it was my duty to make sweeping assertions. What I have said, I have said under a sense of duty, but I have been guarded in my statements because I did not want to give occasion for anyone to be conscience for another. I have been passing through an experience in this country 
that is similar to the experience I had in new fields in America. I have seen families whose circumstances would not permit them to furnish their table with healthful food. Unbelieving neighbors have sent them in portions of meat from animals recently killed. They have made soup of the meat and supplied their large families of children with meals of bread and soup. It was not my duty, nor did I think it was the duty of anyone else, to lecture them upon the evils of meat-eating. I feel sincere pity for families who have newly come to the faith and who are so pressed with poverty that they know not from whence their next meal is coming. It is not my duty to discourse to them on healthful eating. There is a time to speak and a time to keep silent. The opportunity furnished by circumstances of this order is an opportunity to speak words that will encourage and bless rather than condemn and reprove. Those who have lived upon a meat diet all their life do not see the evil of continuing the practice, and they must be treated tenderly. While working against gluttony and intemperance, we must recognize the condition to which the human family is subjected. God has made provision for those who live in the different countries of the world. Those who desire to be co-workers with God must consider carefully before they specify just what foods should and should not be eaten. We are to be brought into connection with the masses. Should health reform in its most extreme form be taught to those whose circumstances forbid its adoption, more harm than good would be done. As I preach the gospel to the poor, I am instructed to tell them to eat that food which is most nourishing. I cannot say to them, you must not eat eggs or milk or cream. You must use no butter in the preparation of food. The gospel must be preached to the poor, but the time has not yet come to prescribe the strictest diet. A Wrong Method of Working do not catch hold of isolated ideas and make them a test, criticizing others whose practice may not agree with your opinion, but study the subject broadly and deeply and seek to bring your own ideas and practices into perfect harmony with the principles of true Christian temperance. There are many who try to correct the lives of others by attacking what they regard as wrong habits. They go to those whom they think in error and point out their defects, but do not seek to direct the mind to true principles. Such a course often comes far short of securing the desired results. When we make it evident that we are trying to correct others, we too often arouse their combativeness and do more harm than good. And there is the danger to the reprover also. He who takes it upon himself to correct others is likely to cultivate a habit of fault-finding, and soon his whole interest will be in picking flaws and finding defects. Do not watch others to pick at their faults or expose their errors. Educate them to better habits by the power of your own example. Let it ever be kept before the mind that the great object of hygienic reform is to secure the highest possible development of mind and soul and body. All the laws of nature, which are the laws of God, are designed for our good. Obedience to them will promote our happiness in this life and will aid us in a preparation for the life to come. There is something better to talk about than the faults and weaknesses of others. Talk of God and His wonderful works. Study into the manifestations of His love and wisdom in all the works of nature. Teach by example. In your association with unbelievers, do not allow yourselves to be swerved from right principles. If you sit at their table, eat temperately, and only of food that will not confuse the mind. Keep clear of intemperance. 
You cannot afford to weaken your mental or physical powers, lest you become unable to discern spiritual things. Keep your mind in such a condition that God can impress it with the precious truths of His Word. Do not watch others in order to point out their faults or errors. Teach by example. Let your self-denial and your victory over appetite be an illustration of obedience to right principles. Let your life bear witness to the sanctifying, ennobling influence of truth. Present temperance in its most attractive form. The Lord desires every minister, every physician, every church member to be careful not to urge those who are ignorant of our faith to make sudden changes in diet, thus bringing them to a premature test. Hold up the principles of health reform and let the Lord lead the honest in heart. They will hear and believe. The Lord does not require His messengers to present the beautiful truths of health reform in a way that will prejudice the minds of others. Let no one place stumbling blocks before those who are walking in the dark paths of ignorance. Even in praising a good thing, it is well not to be too enthusiastic, lest you turn out of the way those who come to hear. Present the principles of temperance in their most attractive form. We must not move presumptuously. The laborers who enter new territory to raise up churches must not create difficulties by attempting to make prominent the question of diet. They should be careful not to draw the lines too closely. Impediments should thus be thrown on the pathway of others. Do not drive the people. Lead them. Preach the word as it is in Christ Jesus. Workers must put forth resolute, persevering effort, remembering that everything cannot be learned at once. They must have a fixed determination patiently to teach the people. Do you not remember that we have an individual accountability? We do not make articles of diet a test question, but we do try to educate the intellect and to arouse the moral sensibility to take hold of health reform in an intelligent manner, as Paul presents it in Romans 13, 8 to 14, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 12. Meet the people where they are. On one occasion, Sarah McEnterfer was called to a family at Dora Creek where every member of the household was sick. The father belonged to a highly respectable family, but he had taken to drink, and his wife and children were in great want. At this time of sickness there was nothing in the house suitable to eat, and they refused to eat anything that we took them. They had been accustomed to having meat. We felt that something must be done. I said to Sarah, Take chickens from my place and prepare them some broth. So Sarah treated them for their illness and fed them with this broth. They soon recovered. Now this is the course we pursued. We did not say to the people, You must not eat meat. Although we did not use flesh foods ourselves, when we thought it essential for that family in their time of sickness, we gave them what we felt they needed. There are occasions when we must meet the people where they are. The father of this family was an intelligent man. When the family was well again, we opened to them the scriptures, and this man was converted and accepted the truth. He threw away his pipe and gave up the use of drink, and from that time, as long as he lived, he neither smoked nor drank. As soon as it was possible, we took him on our farm, and gave him work on the land. While we were away attending meetings in Newcastle, this man died. Thorough treatment was given him by some of our workers, but the long-abused body could not respond to their efforts. But he died a Christian and a commandment keeper. 
meeting extreme views, a historical statement. When we returned from Kansas in the autumn of 1870, Brother B was at home, sick with fever. His case was critical. There was no period of time for us, however much we needed it. The review, the reformer, and the instructor must be edited. Their editors were all sick at this time. My husband commenced his labor, and I helped him what I could. The reformer was about dead. Brother B. had urged the extreme positions of Dr. Trawl. This had influenced the doctor to come out in the reformer stronger than he otherwise would have done in discarding milk, sugar, and salt. The position to entirely discontinue the use of these things may be right in its order, but the time had not come to take a general stand upon these points. And those who do take their position and advocate the entire disuse of milk, butter, and sugar should have their own tables free from these things. Brother B., even while taking his stand in the reformer with Dr. Trawl in regard to the injurious effects of salt, milk, and sugar, did not practice the things he taught. Upon his own table these things were used daily. Many of our people had lost their interest in the reformer, and letters were daily received with this discouraging request, Please discontinue my reformer. We could not raise an interest anywhere in the West to obtain subscribers for the health reformer. We saw that the writers in the reformer were going away from the people and leaving them behind. If we take positions that conscientious Christians, who are indeed reformers, cannot adopt, how can we expect to benefit the class whom we can reach only from a health standpoint? Patience, caution, and consistency necessary in reform movements. We must go no faster than we can take those with us whose consciences and intellects are convinced of the truths we advocate. We must meet the people where they are. Some of us have been many years in arriving at our present position in health reform. It is slow work to obtain a reform in diet. We have powerful appetites to meet, for the world is given to gluttony. If we should allow the people as much time as we have required to come up to the present advanced state in reform, we would be very patient with them and allow them to advance step by step, as we have done, until their feet are firmly established upon the health reform platform. But we should be very cautious not to advance too fast, lest we be obliged to retrace our steps. In reforms, we would better come one step short of the mark than to go one step beyond it. And if there is error at all, let it be on the side next to the people. Above all things, we should not, with our pens, advocate positions that we do not put to a practical test in our own families, upon our own tables. This is a dissimulation, a species of hypocrisy. In Michigan, we can get along better without salt, sugar, and milk than can many who are situated in the far west or in the far east, where there is a scarcity of fruit. We know that a free use of these things is positively injurious to health, and in many cases we think that if they were not used at all, a much better state of health would be enjoyed. But at present our burden is not upon these things. The people are so far behind that we see it is all they can bear to have us draw the line upon their injurious indulgences and stimulating narcotics. We bear positive testimony against tobacco, spiritous liquors, snuff, tea, coffee, flesh meats, butter, spices, rich cakes, 
mince pies, a large amount of salt, and all exciting substances used as articles of food. If we come to persons who have not been enlightened in regard to health reform and present our strongest positions at first, there is danger of their becoming discouraged as they see how much they have to give up so that they will make an effort to reform. We must lead the people along patiently and gradually, remembering the hole of the pit whence we were digged. Part 3. Cooking Schools A Work of Utmost Importance Wherever medical missionary work is carried on in our large cities, cooking schools should be held. And wherever a strong educational missionary work is in progress, a hygienic restaurant of some sort should be established, which shall give a practical illustration of the proper selection and the healthful preparation of foods. Cooking schools are to be held. The people are to be taught how to prepare wholesome food. They are to be shown the need of discarding unhealthful foods. But we should never advocate a starvation diet. It is possible to have a wholesome, nutritious diet without the use of tea, coffee, and flesh food. The work of teaching the people how to prepare a dietary that is at most wholesome and appetizing is of the utmost importance. Some, after adopting a vegetarian diet, return to the use of flesh meat. This is foolish indeed and reveals a lack of knowledge of how to provide proper food in the place of meat. Cooking schools conducted by wise instructors are to be held in America and in other lands. Everything that we can do should be done to show the people the value of the reformed diet. The diet reform should be progressive. As disease in animals increases, the use of milk and eggs will become more and more unsafe. An effort should be made to supply their place with other things that are healthful and inexpensive. The people everywhere should be taught how to cook without milk and eggs so far as possible and yet have their food wholesome and palatable. Those who can avail themselves of the advantages of properly conducted hygienic cooking schools will find it a great benefit both in their own practice and in teaching others. In every church, church school, and mission field, every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to give Bible readings, how to conduct and teach Sabbath school classes, how best to help the poor and to care for the sick, how to work for the unconverted. There should be schools of health, cooking schools, and classes in various lines of Christian help work. There should not only be teaching, but actual work under experienced instructors. Every hygienic restaurant should be a school for the workers connected with it. In the cities, this line of work may be done on a much larger scale than in smaller places. But in every place where there is a church and a church school, instruction should be given in regard to the preparation of simple health foods for the use of those who wish to live in accordance with the principles of health reform. And in all our missionary fields, a similar work can be done. The work of combining fruits, seeds, grains and roots into wholesome foods is the Lord's work. In every place where a church has been established, let the church members walk humbly before God. Let them seek to enlighten the people with health reform principles. Their rightful place. As far as possible, our camp meetings should be wholly devoted to spiritual interests. Business matters should be attended to by those specially appointed for this work. And as far as possible, they should be brought before the people at some other time than the camp meeting. Instruction in canvassing, in Sabbath school work, and in the details of tract and missionary work should be given in the home churches 
or in meetings specially appointed. The same principle applies to cooking schools. While these are all right in their place, they should not occupy the time of our camp meetings. A reforming agency. Cooking schools are to be established in many places. This work may begin in a humble way, but as intelligent cooks do their best to enlighten others, the Lord will give them skill and understanding. The word of the Lord is, Forbid them not, for I will reveal myself to them as their instructor. He will work with those who carry out his plans, teaching the people how to bring about a reformation in their diet by the preparation of healthful, inexpensive foods. Thus the poor will be encouraged to adopt the principles of health reform. They will be helped to become industrious and self-reliant. It has been presented to me that men and women of capability were being taught of God how to prepare wholesome, palatable foods in an acceptable manner. Many of these were young, and there were also those of mature age. I have been instructed to encourage the conducting of cooking schools in all places where medical missionary work is being done. Every inducement to lead the people to reform must be held out before them. Let as m much light as possible shine upon them. Shall we not do in all our power to advance the work in all of our large cities? Thousands upon thousands who live near us need help in various ways. Let the ministers of the gospel remember that the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Matthew 5, 14 and 13. Teaching from home to home. Because the avenues to the soul have been closed by the tyrant prejudice, many are ignorant of the principles of healthful living. Good service can be done by teaching the people how to prepare healthful food. This line of work is as essential as any that can be taken up. More cooking schools should be established, and some should labor from house to house, giving instruction in the art of cooking wholesome foods. Many, many will be rescued from physical, mental, and moral degeneracy through the influence of health reform. These principles will commend themselves to those who are seeking for light, and such will advance from this to receive the full truth for this time. God wants his people to receive, to impart. As impartial, unselfish witnesses, they are to give to others what the Lord has given them. And as you enter into this work, and by whatever means in your power seek to reach hearts, be sure to work in a way that will remove prejudice instead of creating it. Make the life of Christ your constant study and labor as he did, following his example. Teaching diet reform at holiday gatherings and special entertainments. When the light of health reform first came to us, we used on holiday occasions to take cooking stoves to the grounds where the people were assembled and right there bake unleavened bread, gems, and rolls. And I think that the result of our efforts was good, though, of course, we had not the health food preparations that we now have. At that time, we were just beginning to learn how to live without using flesh meat. Sometimes we gave entertainments, and we took great care that all that we prepared for the table was palatable and nicely served. In fruit season, we would get blueberries and raspberries fresh from the bushes and strawberries fresh from the vines. We made the table fair an object lesson 
which showed those present that our diet, even though it was in accordance with the principles of health reform, was far from being a meager one. Sometimes a short temperance lecture was given in connection with these entertainments, and thus people became acquainted with our principles of living. As far as we know, all were pleased and all were enlightened. We always had something to say about the necessity of providing wholesome food and of preparing it simply and yet making it so palatable and appetizing that those eating it would be satisfied. The world is full of the temptation to indulge appetite, and words of warning, earnest and right to the point, have made wonderful changes in families and in individuals. The opportunities and dangers of our restaurants. Light was also given that in the cities there would be opportunity to do a work similar to that which we did on the Battle Creek Fairgrounds. In harmony with this light, hygienic restaurants have been established, but there is grave danger that our restaurant workers will become so imbued with the spirit of commercialism that they will fail to impart the light which the people need. Our restaurants bring us in contact with many people, but if we allow our minds to be engrossed with the thought of financial profit, we shall fail to fulfill the purpose of God. He would have us take advantage of every opportunity to present the truth that is to save men and women from eternal death. I have tried to ascertain how many souls have been converted to the truth as a result of the restaurant work here in blank. Some may have been saved, but many more might be converted to God if every effort were made to conduct the work in God's order and to let light shine into the pathway of others. I would say to the workers connected with the restaurant, do not continue to work as you have been working. Seek to make the restaurant a means of communicating to others the light of present truth. For this purpose only have our restaurants been established. The workers in the blank restaurant and the members of the blank church need to be thoroughly converted. To everyone has been given the talent of intellect. Have you received power to prevail with God? As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Tact and discretion required in educators. Greater efforts should be put forth to educate the people in the principles of health reform. Cooking schools should be established and house-to-house -house instruction should be given in the art of cooking wholesome food. Old and young should learn how to cook more simply. Wherever the truth is presented, the people are to be taught how to prepare food in a simple yet appetizing way. They are to be shown that a nourishing diet can be provided without the use of flesh foods. Much tact and discretion should be employed in preparing nourishing food to take the place of that which has formerly constituted the diet of those who are learning to be health reformers. Faith in God, earnestness of purpose, and a willingness to help one another will be required. A diet lacking in the proper elements of nutrition brings reproach upon the cause of health reform. We are mortal and must supply ourselves with food that will give proper nourishment to the body cooking classes in all our schools. In all our schools there should be those who are fitted to teach cooking. Classes for instruction in this subject should be held. Those who are receiving a training for service suffer a great loss when they do not gain a knowledge of how to prepare food so that it is both wholesome and palatable. The science of cooking is not a small matter. The skillful preparation of food is one of the most essential arts. It should be regarded as among the most valuable of all the arts because it is so closely connected with the life. Both physical and mental strength depend to a great degree upon the food we eat. 
Therefore, the one who prepares the food occupies an important and elevated position. Both young men and young women should be taught how to cook economically and to dispense with everything in the line of flesh food. Let no encouragement be given to the preparation of dishes which are composed in any degree of flesh food, for this is pointing to the darkness and ignorance of Egypt rather than to the purity of health reform. Women especially should learn how to cook. What part of the education of a girl is so important as this? Whatever may be her circumstances in life, here is knowledge that she may put to practical use. It is a branch of education which has a most direct influence upon health and happiness. There is practical religion in a loaf of good bread. Many young people will come to school who desire a training in industrial lines. The industrial instruction should include the keeping of accounts, carpentry, and everything that is comprehended in farming. Preparation should also be made for teaching blacksmithing, painting, shoemaking, cooking, baking, laundering, mending, typewriting, and printing. Every power at our command is to be brought into this training work that students may go out equipped for the duties of practical life. Connected with our sanitariums and schools, there should be cooking schools where instruction is given on the proper preparation of food. In all our schools, there should be those who are fitted to educate the students, both men and women, in the art of cooking. Women especially should learn how to cook. The students in our schools should be taught how to cook. Let tact and skill be brought into this branch of education. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is working to turn the feet of the youth into paths of temptation that lead to ruin. We must strengthen and help them to withstand the temptations that are to be met on every side regarding the indulgence of appetite. To teach them the science of healthful living is to do missionary work for the master. Manual training is deserving of far more attention than it has received. Schools should be established that in addition to the highest mental and moral culture shall provide the best possible facilities for physical development and industrial training. Instruction should be given in agriculture, manufactures, covering as many as possible of the most useful trades, also in household economy, healthful cookery, sewing, hygienic dressmaking, the treatment of the sick, and kindred lines. Faithfulness in common duties. Many of the branches of study that consume the student's time are not essential to usefulness or happiness. But it is essential for every youth to have a thorough acquaintance with everyday duties. If need be, a young woman can dispense with a knowledge of French and algebra or even of the piano, but it is indispensable that she learn to make good bread, to fashion neatly fitting garments, and to perform efficiently the many duties that pertain to homemaking. To the health and happiness of the whole family, nothing is more vital than skill and intelligence on the part of the cook. By ill-prepared, unwholesome food, she may hinder and even ruin both the adult's usefulness and the child's development. Or by providing food adapted to the needs of the body, and at the same time, inviting and palatable, she can accomplish as much in the right as otherwise she accomplishes in the wrong direction. So, in many ways, life's happiness is bound up with faithfulness in common duties. Since both men and women have a part in homemaking, boys as well as girls should gain a knowledge of household duties. To make a bed, and put a room in order, to wash dishes, to prepare a meal, to wash and prepare his own clothing, is a training that need not make any boy less manly. 
It will make him happier and more useful. To prepare his own clothing is a training that need not make any boy less manly. It will make him happier and more useful.